Okay, uh, so we're live and we're recording. Um, so thank you all so much for coming to Sustainable Claremont's inaugural Green Home Tour. This is the, the third night of our four night uh, of tours. We, the first week um, we looked at uh, solar power and net zero um, residential home. Uh, the second week we looked at uh, Sorrel Steel Stress House and we looked at backyard chickens and gray water systems. And then tonight we have a really exciting night. We're here with Becky and Christine and we're gonna be talking about their home and all the great energy efficiency upgrades and solar and landscaping and all the great things that they've done at their house. Um, if this is your first week joining us, we'll have all of our um, recordings on our website for you to view at a later date. And we'll also have our um, uh, resource guide available for you and that'll, that'll lay out all the different resources that um, we touched on at each of our four nights of the tour. That'll be available on our website once the tour is over. Um, this program is really meant to be a, a resource for you, the community, and, and our network of Sustainable Claremont members. Uh, we've been talking to these different uh, homeowners in the community and, and renters and seniors in the community who have made significant steps to live more sustainable, uh, sustainably, and we want you to be able to, to learn from what they've done. So they've done hours of researching, they've talked to different vendors, they've, they've looked at different products, they've you know, seen different manufacturers. And so the choices that they've made and the process that they went through is something that we want to communicate to you to, to help you take that first step towards living more sustainably. Um, tonight and, and all of the nights of the tour have been made possible by our amazing sponsors, um, including Southern California Edison, Energy Upgrade California, Lewis Management Group, and Carol Holder and John Mellencrot. And it's only because of them that we were able to offer this tour free for all of our participants and it will remain free on our website and YouTube um, into the future. So really fortunate that we were able to offer this um, free of charge so that it could really be a community a community resource for, for everybody. Um, tonight, we have a really exciting night, one that I've been really looking forward to because we're focusing on home energy efficiency. Um, prior to uh, this evening, I was looking into some of the data on er energy efficiency. And recently the, the NRDC re released a report saying that residential efficiency can account for as much as 550 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions reductions annually by 2050. And so to give some sense of the scale that's equal to the combined electric power emissions from California, Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, and Virginia in 2016. And so it's one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gases and by living more efficiently, we could you know, make significant steps um, towards reducing our impact on climate change. So it really kind of drives home the importance of tonight and why we're so excited to be spotlighting energy efficiency. Um, so if you've been with us on our previous nights, to, tonight will be the same format. We'll start with a brief video tour of Christine and Becky's home. Um, and then we'll follow that with a, a conversation between myself and Christine and Becky. Um, and this really is an opportunity for, for you all, the viewers um, and attendees tonight to have your questions answered. So any, at any point along the way tonight, um, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box or to raise your hand um, by pressing the little raise hand button in your Zoom. And we'll try to get to all the questions. Um, if, if we don't get to the questions for some reason, we'll be sure to, to catalog those questions, get them answered, and then send them back to all the attendees um, after, after tonight's tour. Okay, um, so one last thing before we get started here. Um, we are really focusing on energy efficiency tonight. Uh, sort of the flip side of the same coin with energy efficiency is energy conservation. Um, one of our sponsors is Energy Upgrade California, and, and their real focus is energy conservation. And they have a really cool fact sheet uh, that we'd like to provide you. Angela's going to drop in the chat box if you'd like to download it. Um, just outlining some of the, the really simple steps that you can take, small steps that you can take that, if we all take, have a really big impact on decreasing the amount of energy that we use. So just another resource that we'd like to provide you all um, tonight. Okay. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna get going with our, our video. So one second here as I transition. Okay. 
sorry, there's still like no quick way to do this. All right, here we go. Angela, can you see the screen okay? Yep. Okay, and let me know if the sound's okay. It's a little. Hey, so I'm Becky Margiata, Christine Margiata. Uh, and I grew up here in Claremont and we moved back here in 2017. We had been looking at properties for a while and we had seen this one, but it was in total disrepair and it's kind of scared us off, but someone came and fixed it up and they made the inside really nice. The outside was still a bit of a hot mess. And we realized this is where we want to raise our kids. This is our forever home. So we've been doing all kinds of things to make it so it'll be really energy efficient and, and uh, sustainable for the rest of our lives at least, maybe even our kids. So we have a lot of friends who are real leaders, in, in both, both locally sustainable Claremont, but also internationally. So John Hepburn from Project Sunrise in Australia was staying in our home and we were asking him like, what should we do, what should we do? And it was pretty soon after we had moved in here and John said, first thing, do an energy efficiency. That's gonna be the thing that in the long term really is the most bang for your buck and really sets you up for success. Another major influence on us was a friend of ours, Bruce Nillis, who was the guy who was behind shutting down all the coal plants uh, in the United States or stopping them or shutting them down. Uh, and, and his new thing is on uh, switching from gas to electric wherever possible, especially in Southern California where there's earthquakes. And so another priority for us has been getting off of gas and onto electric. So these are like, they're not sexy, but they're behind the scenes things that we think set us up for the long term. One of the first things we wanted to take care of was going to solar um, and the tax credits were about to expire and we were and we already knew from our home inspection that we needed a new roof and so we we're like well let's just kill two birds with one stone and so actually pretty quickly after we moved in the first thing we did was put a brand new roof on that's a 50 year, it's reflective even though it's black. I think it's called GAF. We wanted to do a metal roof, which is the most fire resistant and I think would be really kind of give this home a more modern look, but uh, the city said, no, it's not in keeping with the local architecture. So, and, and winter was coming, the rains were about to start. So we went ahead and then on top of that, we put some solar with Semper Solaris and it's kind of a mid-grade solar. We didn't, we didn't go with the cheapest option or the most expensive option. Uh, and we, we really liked Semper Solaris. I liked them, they were veteran owned and run and, and they did a really good job in explaining to us and educating us as customers. So we felt comfortable proceeding with them and have been really happy with, I mean, no problem. I think that's probably true for most solar installations, <laughs> yeah. kind of not a problem, but uh, we, we've been happy with it. We had a 1992 air conditioner, right? And we were like, just come change out the air conditioner, and they and we put in a much higher efficiency air conditioner, but it was the right. same old. It was still a, it was heat and right. air conditioner, and the heat was still gas. And this mm -hmm. is before we knew about doing an energy audit. We also put in a whole bunch of insulation in the attic because we froze our butts off in the winter. Right. So we were like, oh my God, get some insulation in here. Didn't help. But it, it didn't really help, and yeah. it was done poorly. And so uh, we wouldn't recommend that that contractor to do it. Um, we still think there's problems with the, the insulation in our attic. But the new air conditioner is great. Unfortunately, if we had to do it all over again, what we learned in our energy audit is we wish we had uh, done a heat pump and put that in the attic and then the ducts wouldn't have to travel as far. We learned all this later for 300 bucks. We learned this, but we had already spent like 10,000 bucks on the new HVAC and that's gonna be good for at least another 15 years. And so we're kind of locked in with something that uses gas for 15 years. I mean, we could bite our nose to spite our face, but that would just feel kind of stupid at this point to get rid of it just because it's gas. Um, so I think in about a dozen years or as this HVAC starts to cycle out, then we'll go to uh, a heat pump system in our attic with really short ducts to everywhere in our home um, that only uses electric. And, uh, and that'll be, that is probably our largest use of gas, our only use of gas by, by that point. We called Building Doctors. They came out here and for just $350 did this super thorough assessment of our home head to toe, every, every single nook and cranny um, with 18 pages of recommendations of what to do. It was really, it was well worth the $350. So there's some immediate things we did with the energy audit. The first was our, and this part of this is this, this home was, is built in the mid fifties. And so there's just stuff, and the owners had had it before for a long time. I think there's just stuff that life cycle was, was getting ready to go. So our water heater was on the fritz and it was a gas water heater. And we had the opportunity to switch that from gas to electric, which we've done. If we had to do it over again, I think we would have gotten like a slightly larger 
gallons per minute than we have, but just with our, as our kids are getting older, they're taking longer showers, but it's still workable. It's still totally workable. And, and we're really happy to be off of gas on that one. And now we can use our solar to keep our water warm, which is great. But the other thing that was happening was we had this, this just disgusting stucco around our house. It was like, I mean, I called it big booger stucco. It was just these big, gross, nasty honks of stucco blown really unprofessionally all over our house. It was so gross. And uh, our, our contractor, uh, Marco Contreras, who's amazing with rank one construction. So he was sandblasting and taking out all of the stucco over the summer so he could put on a nice smooth Santa Barbara finished stucco. Literally while the house, the building doctors were here, they were sandblasting the stucco and they said, whoa, this is your opportunity. You, you don't have any insulation whatsoever in your exterior walls. And uh, what, if, if now that they're, since they're gonna stucco over it anyways, this is your golden opportunity. They took uh, a, a huge drill bit, they drilled into our exterior stucco walls, and then they pumped in insulation um, and then closed it up. And then uh, rank one construction uh, stuccoed over it. And so now all of our exterior walls have really thick, uh, uh, really good insulation, which has helped in maintaining the temperature. We don't need to run the air conditioner near as much it, it, or the heater near as much in the winter. So uh, it really maintains the temperature inside the house much, much better. And there's just this unique window of opportunity. They could have done it from the interior walls too. It's really not that huge of a big deal. It was just kind of this perfect timing kind of thing. It's like now you can see, like you never know that they did it. You know, it's totally smooth, but that had every 18 inches, there was a, a, a big, great big hole. We've done essentially a gut renovation of every bit of the exterior of, of our home and of our yard. And so when we moved in, there was pink concrete hardscape everywhere and really not much in the way of, of landscaping going on. It's pretty awful. There's this big dirt berm in front that literally just had dirt on it. And we've literally gut renovated the entire backyard first and then the front yard. We did the backyard first because this is just where we spend a lot of time with our children. Um, we put in, I think we have 10 fruit trees that are starting to mature and we wanted to enjoy citrus. We put in that Virginia oak tree. We wanted a lot of shade in the afternoon and we put in the raised garden beds and we that's pretty much year round we have with, with food that we can eat out of that. We were composting ourselves, but uh, we were doing such a bad job of it we went with sustainable claremont has the composting cooperative and so now in our front yard we have exclusively native it's all stuff from the california botanic garden so the grass is a native grass with subsurface watering and all the plants along the eastern side of our house are all natives the northern side are all mediterranean and, and do really well here that's part of our intention is that we give back our land to as much as possible to, to nature, to, um, so that it can be regenerative, so it can be part of the sustainable and so that nature can heal itself on the land that we're using. Oh, I'm still muted. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. All right, great. Well, Becky and Christine, thank you so much for, for sharing your home with us and for, for being here tonight to, um, to talk to us about your home. I, I thought the video was really great at sort of um, uh, breaking down the timeline and all of the, the different elements that you focused on when you were upgrading or you know, renovating your home. So we're going to have just to like back up for a second, um, if you could tell us a little bit about what the house was like when you first saw it, when you first purchased it. I know there was kind of like a back and forth, like uh, you went multiple times to look at the same home. If you can tell us a little bit about that process. Sure. Well, first, just thank you. Thank you so much for having us and for doing this series. It's good to see everyone. Uh, and just grateful to you all, to Sustainable Claremont, and to so many of your, your members and board members for guiding us through pieces of this process. Uh, and I'll just say, any anytime we talk about our home and the land we're on, we're, uh, we're mindful that we are on the land of the Tongva people and you know, want, to, want to acknowledge that, that we are, we are on stolen land. And as Becky was talking about in the video, you know, we think about how do we return this land uh, to those to whom it belongs, uh, which we think of as both 
the natural landscape and, and the native plants uh, and also the, the native people uh, whose land we're on. So we're always mindful of that when, when talking about this space and uh, yeah, just mindful of, of those dynamics as we talk about it as ours. Uh, we think of that as a, as a very temporary situation. Um, so when I, I think about when we first uh, came to see this home, uh, we were we had come here often to visit my parents. Uh, I, I grew up here, as I mentioned in the video, uh, and didn't imagine moving back here. And one day on a on a whim, we came to an open house in this home, and um, we walked in through the front door, and uh, I think knew pretty instantly that this was the place we wanted to raise our kids, and we didn't want to stop and talk to the realtor uh, because I think we were both worried that we would try to buy it on the spot. <laughs> we just walked out the back door and across the street to the park and just talked about, oh my gosh, are we really going to move our family here and, um, you know, just cha change our lives pretty significantly. Uh, so the house on the inside was uh, beautiful and, and just, as we, just as we wanted it to be, the outside as you shared in the photos. Uh, was very different than it is now. So uh, most of our attention in terms of tending to the space and, and making it feel like a home has been to the outside, uh, to, the, to the front and backyard. And, and again, thinking about how we return that to nature and um, make it as, as sustainable and supportive a space as possible. All right, so when you, when you purchase the house, um, looking at those pictures, like you can tell like there's a lot of, <laughs> changes that have been made since the time you purchased it until now what drove like that decision making process like what I, I think you talked a little bit about how um you know there's some timing elements and you needed to do things before the rain or before the summer and then you had things that you wanted to do because of what bruce or, or john sort of advised you on what were some like the first changes that were made once you once you got the house it was it, we, we were really um we had gotten the home inspection report and and all that really said was you don't really have any insulation to speak of in your attic and so that was an early priority mm -hmm. uh, especially we moved in in october and winter was coming mm -hmm. so th that was kind of the only thing we really thought about and the roof the inspection also oh, yeah, showed the, that roof. the roof only had another year or two in it so we knew the roof would need to be replaced pretty soon yeah that was that was on our radar and then I think from a values place, we've we've wanted to be as thoughtful as we can around minimalizing our our footprint, you know. And uh, so, but that 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 came second in some ways. Like we just sort of, and then things break, you know. So we were just kind of <laughs> uh, just doing doing what we could. But the first thing was getting some insulation in the attic. Um, we've subsequently had two different contractors come through for different reasons and say hey, that ain't right, you know? And we're like, we don't know what it's supposed to look like. And they're like, not this. And I like, I climb up there and I'm like, I don't understand what I'm looking at. And they're like pointing at things that are wrong. And the, the person from the company we bought the, the insulation from, the owner came and looked at it. He was like, no, it's good, you know? And I was like, nobody else thinks it's good, but I don't know what to tell you. So uh, that, that's kind of an ongoing uh, rock in our shoe, I think, is that we don't really believe that the attic insulation is sufficient um, or well done, but that was the first thing. And then we cleaned the ducts, and then later we replaced the ducts, total waste of money. Like, we've just done stuff that, like, if we had had it to do over again, we would do it in a different order with different contractors in a different way, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. And so one of the things that you mentioned early on was needing to, to purchase a new roof. Um, and for some aesthetic reasons, but also for sustainability reasons, you're looking at steel roofs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why, what is the sustainability component of that? And how was um, the one that you went with, um, uh, the, the GAF um, roof, uh, sort of a, a midway point between some roofs and being you know, somewhat sustainable, though not the the metal roof. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you you want to... we we just kind of geeked out and and Googled things and talked to we have a friend who's an architect who's helped us a lot with the even the design of the exterior spaces. And I don't remember all the super nerdy things. I just remember being a hundred percent convinced that a steel roof would 
it would be the, the most pre preventing of a fire should it happen. Uh, and, and also, uh, was super, they're good forever, basically, you know, and, um, and, uh, and also have really good insulation values. And I think it would look really cool. Actually. I think it would kind of update things a little bit, but when we went to go, we, we actually found a contractor and didn't even think anything of it and went to the city to get our permit. And that's when we were told, um, oh, it's not in keeping with the homes in your area and we were like yeah and they were like <laughs> you know and they were like um no it has to be consistent with the architecture in the area and we're like well how's anything ever get updated you know and improved then and they were like well it's like it's like how if you want to cut in the line and they're like you can if you get a note from everybody in front of you you can go they basically said something like we had to put a, a notice to everybody within a hundred yards in every direction that it would get, be reviewed at the architectural committee. And that just sounded like such a hassle. And uh, we were coming up on A, the rainy season. So we wanted to get the roof in. So we could, you know, we, we just didn't have time for all that nonsense. Um, and also the end of the calendar year, which is when the solar credits would, would be less attractive. And so we wanted to bang it out before, before the end of the calendar year. And so we just decided, heck with it. And uh, the the fifty year gaff is probably as good as you. I think that's as good as you can get. Otherwise, from a sustainability and we, even though it's black, it's it's reflective. It's just some. There's some. I don't know. You know there, there's high high reflective shingles and and um, we've been. I think it looks nice. I think we're 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 fine with it. And so, um, and I and I, and I think it's like. I mean, I probably won't be alive in 50 years, you know, if I'm like, if I'm calling in that warranty, <laughs> that's, a, that's an accomplishment. So, right. Yeah. Do you happen to know, um, so I looked up gaff roof uh, shingles and do you happen to know if it's part of their reflector series, they have like a, a line that's supposedly, um, uh, meets the requirements of a cool roof according to California's t uh, Title 24 standards. Oh, Is yeah, that what you yeah. recall? Yeah, yeah. I think I can look up. I have this like great big uh, pile of. <laughs> but I think we, I think don't I think you have to, if I recall correctly, that it's not optional. That the only things you can get are ref are reflective. Um, uh, but but I, I may have that wrong. Um, but I can I can definitely look that up in, in our roof roof piles. Sure. Um, but it, okay. Or, or exactly what it is, you know. Um, yeah, no worries. Right now, uh, we have a couple of questions about you. You were talking from the audience. Um, we have a couple of questions about the insulation in the attic. Yeah. Um, so people are wondering what kind of insulation it was was it the bats you know the roll that you roll out um or yeah. was it something blown in or do you know we had, more what was what was wrong or not in the right kind? okay yeah it's in the inspection report so we had um r38 we had r38 bats okay so, which is that is the the as i understand it the insulation standard Right, like that, like right, like R thirty eight, um, uh, and, and some of the pictures in the um, home report, which I, I mean, I could put the PDF so you could see what a home report looks like in the chat if you want. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any passwords to our house or anything in there, <laughs> uh, but they had pictures that, like, with arrows of like this is not okay, and so it was. Mm -hmm. Basically, for it to be fully have its R38 insulation value, it needs to be puffed out um, and it needs to be kind of symmetrical and flat. And there were just places where I think they cut corners and it was just kind of sticking out and edges and squished down. And, and some of the stuff around our LED lights was right. not done properly. And in some cases, not, necess not necessarily to code, we found subsequently. So... Um, mm. it was, it was, and, and, and the, the, the building doctors, when they came in and did the edit audit, energy audit, were like, 
you know, basically we just need to, we, do, we need to blow a couple inches on top of that. And they gave us mm -hmm. an estimate to do that. Um, and then uh, I think the main minus on that is if you get some critters in there, that it's really hard to find, <laughs> but right. uh, we, we, I, we're really sealed. I don't think, I think the likelihood of that is low. So that might be our next step. Right. So it wasn't the type of insulation. It was just mainly that installation wasn't well done. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I think the type was just fine. I think that the, I believe the two contractors who came subsequently and said that some weren't quite right. Okay. Yeah. Do we okay, have Stuart. From, from the audience, um, we, keep going? we do. I'll let you. I just wanted to kind of keep things. You know, we'll 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 get to all of them, but we can wait on the other. Couple. Sounds good. Yeah, it looks like some of the other ones are about the audit, which we're going to get yeah. to in just a second here. But before we get to that, um, uh, you mentioned um, John Hepburn and Bruce in your your video. Um, and, and the fact that they both recommended the energy efficiency audit, I think is like fascinating and amazing. But can you talk about, can you just introduce if, if you know, people in our, our network don't know who those two are, who they are and, and yeah, yeah. where they stand? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've met these people through, uh, I train social change leaders around the world on how to design and lead large scale social change. So foundations will, in many cases will say, hey, we're making a great big bet on this person or this organization. And Becky, we want your company to train them up on how to spread and scale what works, right? How to do the scale. So uh, the Climate Breakthrough Project is uh, kind of like the MacArthur Genius Award for climate change. And I don't know if you know the MacArthur Genius Award, but you get like $600,000 and you can't apply for it. You just surprise, you're a genius. And it's $600,000. The Climate Breakthrough Project is almost exactly like that, except it's it's two or two million dollars plus, um, and it's really really big bets. And collectively, the Climate Breakthrough Project is hoping to that their portfolio and they want to make big bets on high risk portfolios that they're hoping collectively their portfolio can account for ten percent greenhouse gas emissions. I think I think wow. in the next ten years. I mean, they're just swinging for the fences there, and so. So we, we train all of their awardees. Uh, and so I meet these folks and I'm like, you know, over, over beer at the end of the day, after I train them, I'm like, what do I do in my house? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm looking for information. So, so uh, John is based out of Australia, John Hepburn. Uh, John um, uh, is the founder of Project Sunrise, um, and, but they, they work internationally. And the thing he got the Climate Breakthrough Award for is the project he's working on effectively is to, to, to take to, it's, I, I don't even understand it thoroughly, but basically his big idea was um, that anybody who's, that, who's investing in fossil fuel needs to get insurance to do these big projects and like big commercial insurance, not like our home insurance. And his, John's big theory of change was to uh, through social pressure, remove the, so, the, the social license that these insurance agencies have for insuring these projects. And if you can shut down the insurance, you can shut down the projects. So that's, you know, but John, John stayed with us for like th three or four days. His, his family was on vacation in Ecuador and, and we were their stopover for Harry Potter world. <laughs> so uh, and that's, and, and we, you know, we, we've just become family friends. Our kids are friends with their friends and um, he, he was, he was like, don't do anything until you do an energy audit. Um, uh, likewise, Bruce, uh, Bruce was, um, with the Sierra club and they had a, a, a national campaign, I forget what it was called beyond, beyond, beyond coal. I think it was, mm -hmm. to, it, it was like, it was like Bruce versus Dick Cheney. <laughs> like, so Dick Cheney was like, how can we get more fossil fuel plants going? You know, and Bruce was like, bam. And they like, just. So uh, they not only did they uh, stop every new coal plant that was uh, on the table for, for production, which would lock in fossil fuel for 50 years, like the life cycle of that coal plant, but they've been able to shut down. I mean, they're on a path to shut down all of them. Uh, so that's, so Bruce is someone that the climate luminaries are making big bets on, but they, when Bruce got multi-million dollars and they're like, what do you want to do next? Bruce was like, I think the next, bad thing is let's go after natural gas the same way we went after coal and that 
um, uh, especially in Southern California, he was making the case to me that with earthquakes and all, he's like, why would you do that? But, but, but especially, especially, I mean, we got like 2,400 square feet or something, but in, in smaller square feet places, um, uh, he, he was he was he was very very convincing about the health the the harmful effects of natural gas in in small apartments and what and and so his main thing is with new not retrofitting but with with new construction as much as possible to um, it, it sort of really really push for 100% electrification and uh, so he he got me like freaking out about whatever we have that's natural gas. <laughs> so as soon as we could, we were like, let's rotate out all of our natural gas appliances and things. And, and both of them suggested the energy efficiency audit. They, well, and so John had suggested it. And then I was like, you know how you just don't really get around to things because you're busy doing other things. And like, I would Google like energy audit 91711. And like, I never found anything that, you know, I didn't really know what I was looking for. Um, but Bruce, so then I, I'm like hanging out with Bruce in Switzerland and, and I'm like, yeah, John told me I should do that too, but I don't know who to go to. And, and Bruce was like, I got a guy. And so he connected me with building doctors and I, I trusted him. And, um, um, so that's like, Bruce is based out of Northern California. So he knew, he knew the folks at building doctors. And, and it's weird how that, how that is that like something that seems so obvious. I mean, maybe it's all over the place in Yelp now, but we couldn't find anybody. No, I think you're, I think it's still the case. Yeah. There aren't a lot of um, companies that specialize in, in, in do that locally here in Southern California. At least we've found, Stuart and I, in preparation for this tour, <laughs> have found that there are not a lot of other folks in that space doing exactly that. There are other versions and slightly different angles that people might take with regard to HVAC systems or insulation in, in particular, um, but to do a thorough, complete breakdown is kind of unique. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, they, they literally showed up in like doctor's outfits. They had scrubs on, <laughs> they had they, their cars were in, fun. which probably get like four miles to the gallon, which is kind of ironic. Oof. But uh, they were like, like they practically had a stethoscope on. They had like, they, they went to town. They, I, I, they really, really were very, very thorough. And, and we were confident we got more than our 300 and whatever dollars worth. So, so what was that like? Okay, so first it was 300 bucks for them to come out and do that. Mm -hmm. And then what do they do? They, they, from the time you call them, how long did it take them to get out there? And do they spend a whole day? Do you have to do anything in preparation? How does it all go down? Yeah, no, they just come, you know, I mean, but they had, it was like the Ghostbusters. I mean, they had like these like laser pointers to see how much heat's coming through and they seal the doors to see how much movement you have. And, you know, it, it probably took them maybe th three hours or so to get, just go head to toe. And then a little bit, a, a little bit later, we got this, this just super detailed assessment of, of everything they would recommend that we do. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I think they also, I think they priced it out too. I, I want to, I want to upload it, but you know, they literally price out nuts and bolts and everything. So you really know what you're paying for. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and uh, I think they did a really good job for us. So uh, yeah, it's, it's solid. So, so when they, they came out and they did the ins inspection, did you need to provide like um, utility bills so they had an idea of how much, you know, um, gas or electricity you were consuming or was it all sort of internal to the house, like them doing the I don't measurements? Think, I don't think they were looking at output. I think they were just looking at it for it is what it is. Do you remember that? Yeah. Our, our solar people needed mm -hmm. electric bills mm -hmm. because they use that to calibrate, right. you know, how much you need. But I don't think they were looking at that at all. Yeah. No, they I were don't just remember sharing any of that. Yeah, yeah, they were just. Okay. So, so now you have that audit in hand. Mm -hmm. How does that? How has that shaped the decisions you make when you're, you know, when it's time to to upgrade something? Are you? I imagine it's still one of those things where you you fix things as you need to right something the the water heater goes out and you need to replace it or did, was it like still early enough in the process that you um were sort of electing to make these changes or or how did you uh, use that shoes. let me see oh we've got somebody who's to be muted here one second 
Yes. I think it's been somewhat of a combination. So in some cases, it was the end of a life cycle for something. And in other cases, it, it felt like a significant enough impact that we that we took action on it more quickly. Yeah. Sometimes we're just like, hey, let's spend a lot of money. <laughs> that was not cheap. <laughs> it's it is like uh, bananas it's expensive to do to do the right thing, yeah. you know. Um, we've really it has been a lot a lot of money to uh, either retrofit or replace, and it costs more to do the things that are the right things to do. I think, which is a shame. I mean, we get like little rebates and all, but like for everything we've done, we've gotten like a little bit of rebate from whoever, but you know, we put in a lot, a lot more. We're not doing it to like save money. This like, it's uh, I wish there were more incentives going the right way structurally. You're doing it to, to reduce the footprint overall, just more so than the, yeah, the cheapest route. Right. It is yeah. not the cheapest route. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, even with the solar, I think they try to make that case that it will pay for itself over time. But I think yeah. they were pretty candid with us that that's not that's not the incentive for doing it. That it's it is not a significant enough savings to have that be the incentive. And and I don't think I don't think that factored in much for us in that case. Yeah, the dollars aren't captured. <laughs> the, the true cost is not captured. Right. Angela, that's the, Angela. That's like the the like the whole point is the externalities aren't built into the true cost, right. mm -hmm. and so it feels expensive because it doesn't. They're not charging what it would cost to mm -hmm. to so with all the consequences. Right? With all the consequences, right. exactly, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so we're able to internalize those costs, but I don't, you know, not everybody can, and we not may not be able to next year when there's the next thing, right? I think it's, you know, we have, we have a, I think, I mean, it's not written down, but we're like, okay, we'll never ever buy a gas car again, you know? And so we'll, our next car will for sure be an electric car, but so, so, you know, it, we'll just, we're going to keep on it, the next appliance will only be electric appliance. So, you know, we're just going to do all that stuff and we'll just, we'll just keep on going forward. Um, as as natural replacement makes sense, right? Right. Yeah, you don't have to do it all at once, right? It, it, the small incremental steps are important, and so I think that's like a point, important point to to sort of drive home. Um, so with, with the audit, um, do the or with building doctors, do they also do the upgrades that they suggest to you in the audit, or do they suggest contractors to work with, or What's the, the relationship between those two things? They, they can do everything. Um, and they, they gave us estimates for some things and we decided to move ahead with some, but not all immediately. Um, okay. um, but I think just we, we will often, we don't always, once we trust a contractor, we're just like, just whatever, tell us what it costs, you know? Uh, but we'll often at the early stages when we're just getting to know somebody, get comps and get, you know, one or two extra bids. And I think their prices were were in line with, you know, standard rates. So we would trust them to to come back again to do it. It's just it didn't make sense to us that to take a a, a year old HVAC system and replace it with a, a heat pump in the attic. That just felt a little excessive. And they weren't strongly pushing that either. But you know, we we could have done that, and they would have done it for us. We were just like, nah. Right. Let's wait till something breaks. Yeah. Did they help you kind of prioritize what they saw as like the biggest um, efficiency gains or like, so that cost benefit between the gains and efficiency versus how much it would be to, to make those? Yeah, they were thoughtful about it. I mean, that's why I was talking to him on the phone. I was like, hey, Bruce told me about you and like our water heater broke. And he was like, what is that noise? And there was the, the stucco, the sandblasting. And he was like, wait a minute, <laughs> you're getting... You're getting the stucco in your house right now, and I was like, "Yeah," and he was like, "Do you have insulation in your walls?" And I was like, "Probably not. We didn't have insulation in our roof. What, what would you think we'd have in our exterior walls?" And he was like, "We need to come out tomorrow." And I was like, "I was like, okay, you know, I mean, we already our house was already overrun with contractors." And uh, he was like, "No, no, we're coming tomorrow." He's like, "Listen, it, you know, this is your window. This is your chance to get the external." Um, 
uh, insulation. And I was like, Hey dude, I just called about a water heater. (laughs) And he was like, listen, this would usually be like, you know, this square foot house, blah, blah, blah. This would be usually be like $15,000. Like I know I'm just like throwing this at you at the last minute. Like, like we'll do it for 8,000 tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, come on out. And, And he came out with a little Ghostbusters gun and was like, look at this, it's 159 degrees in your wall, you know, and it was in the middle of summer. And so we were like, oh yeah, you know, we definitely, you can see there's no insulation whatsoever. And then the house has been more comfortable since then. Mm-hmm. And they were just, they were, I, I, I found them easy to work with and uh, what I would consider to be ethical and, re- and reputable. And so once you started working with them, you didn't feel like you needed to go get quotes for everything, each of the individual sort of upgrades or yeah, we're just kind of like, we do, if we trust, if we know you and trust you, I think also that him recommended by Bruce, you know, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask somebody, but we would ask Marco. So Marco Contreras with rank one construction, he lives in Claremont. He lives over by the Alexander Hughes center. He's done a lot of our um, contracting work for us, him and uh, Ramiro, uh, who unfortunately doesn't do the, the guy who did all our landscape, we get asked all the time, who did your landscaping? It's Ramiro and he's not doing it anymore right now. Or we would have him do more. Like we just like, it's like getting Botox, you know, we just can't stop. But like, uh, <laughs> we've, never gotten, we've never gotten Botox. But like, it's, it's what I hear about that's all about. You know, you just kind of keep going, you know, but like uh, Marco, we ran it by Marco and he was like, oh yeah, that's legit, you know? So right. I think, you know, and so, and we can't say enough good about Marco. I mean, the problem with all the contractors right now is they're booked out like right. six to nine months. All the good ones are. Right. You know? we, I know we have some audience questions, but really quick, just I, I feel like this is a good opportunity to ask an insulation question since you brought it up. Um, so when they when the building doctors came out and and did the, the ex- exterior wall insulation, um, first, did you notice a difference like in just like the how well it insulated your home, like it's, you know, colder during the summers, warmer during the winters, or like maybe on your, um, you know, your energy bill. Like, did was that noticeable after getting that? Not in the so the roof when we had the attic, the insulation in the attic, we did not notice a difference. I would say the exterior walls we did. Uh, the house holds its temperature better, so we're using less air and heat. Uh, both of our both of our bills and the and the usage indicated on the bills has has decreased. Okay, but you you do all the bills, right? Not as much as we thought. Right. Yeah, it's not a significant reduction, but the the usage is down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe the price has just gone up. I maybe think so. That's a piece of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the it, usage yeah. on both both gas and electric has has reduced significantly since all of this. Yeah. Okay, so kind of one other piece of like a bigger, you know, mm-hmm. multiple pieces. Um, and then with the, the insulation, um, when they shoot it in, is it like foam? Is it like fiberglass? Like what are they shooting into the exterior walls? And do you know like how they rate that, what the R value is for that type of insulation? It, it might be in the um, estimate that I could find. Uh, and I, it, it was like the pink stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't foam. I think it was, uh, you know, the fiberglass was... fill maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. 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 I think there's three main types from what I understand. I'm not an expert, but, <laughs> um, fiberglass yeah. cellulose, which is like newspaper, you know, some kind of tree based cellulose product or what's called rock wool, mineral wool. They're all types of materials that are kind of byproducts of other industrial processes. So there's a high, you know, recycled content for all of them, but they all kind of work differently. Yeah. 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 They, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's fiberglass. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then is that, do you know if, if that's something that sort of one and done, or is that something like, you know, that has a 30 year life cycle and then they've got to reassess and, and see if they need to, to you know, intervene and maybe inject more if, it, if yeah. there's upkeep to that at all. I, they didn't mention it. I'm looking now, by the way, um, they put 2.2 pounds per cubic foot. 
into the walls. So that's that's what they did. Um, and we have like a 2,400 square foot home. They didn't do the garage, right? Um, but it was 5,500 bucks. And it was uh, R15 to R15. So R15, wow. That's good yeah. for walls. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they did on there. Yep. Yeah. And, and then in was... their little little nerdy report thing. I mean, there's like, this, we have 18 pages of this stuff, y'all. Said um, most homes built in California before 1978 have no wall insulation. Right. So, yeah, so 78. Yeah, and they did it to R15. Yep. Okay. And did you, so you have this exterior shell that's like super insulated now. Did you also upgrade your, your windows and doors or had that been done or was that on your list or? They said they were good. Yeah, I think they they said the windows the windows were okay. I'm not remembering the yeah. doors. We have double pane windows, okay. so they were like, "You're good." They did they did the the gun, you know, and they were like, "They're good." And yeah. the, the doors, likewise. I think all of that had been replaced when they when they flipped the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, right. And do is there a crawl space or is it on a solid foundation? Your home? Uh, solid foundation. Okay, so you don't have to worry about like insulating like the crawl space or anything like that in basement. Okay, cool. Angela, I'm gonna throw it to you. Are there some okay. questions? We've got? Yeah, there's Great. there's quite a few. Sorry um, about that. Um, I'll just interject. We might bounce around a little bit. I'm trying. I try my best to consolidate things <laughs> so we're not repeating. But I also want to make sure do our best to answer everybody's questions. So about. Um, the wall insulation or working with building doctors do did you notice a difference in the sound um, or do they specifically talk about what effects it might have on sound we went through a process for the sound bath that was in our bedroom right right in between it within the home yeah. right we were also well like two two years later last summer we renovated our bedroom, just interior, and we 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 uh, Marco put uh, uh, sound bats, literally sound bat insulation in the in the wall between our bedroom and our kids' bedroom, just because we're going to have teenagers that are going to irritate us, and so um, we're trying to prevent that. And it, I, it's really good. Like we have guests in our the room adjacent, and we don't hear anything, you know, and so. I haven't noticed it was, anything. It was from, internal. Right. Yeah. From the outside, there isn't much noise that we what? hear inside the house. So I'm, we haven't noticed. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, yeah. even internally. So, did you have to remove drywall or was that blown in as well? That you said it were, there were bats, right? Sound bats. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Was, so, it was, it was like a particular, it's like a, it's like a, a, a type of insulation that specifically, insulates for sound okay so i imagine you could you could get those anywhere you know um it right. would be worth it, it I, we didn't we didn't bring it up we haven't had too many noise complaints we can hear the 210 um we're on a busy street corner we're on the corner of oxford and scripps and so uh at least once a day some idiot rooms you know accelerates or screeches past our house but uh, we can also hear the 210, but I think it's through the windows, not through the, hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So another question about um, the audit insulation related. I think we answered one. It was more about um, in the report someone was wondering, were you just overwhelmed with all that information or did you kind of had have a roadmap for what things might make sense to do first? You know, yeah, prioritization. We, we, it was, it was a little overwhelming and, uh, and they, but then I had a follow-up call with them and, and I was like, Hey, what's nice to do. And what's, what's, what is, what is like, yeah, we should do this when we can. And, 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 they, and they walked through it with us. There were a few things that were, that they considered somewhat urgent, even from a safety standpoint that we took care of right away. And, right. and, uh, and, and so, and the other things now we just have that so that when the, when the time comes, we can, we can follow their, follow their guidance. Right. Okay. 
Um, another question here is, Oh, yes. So did um, someone mentioned that by some analyses, the most effective use of money to improve a home's thermal efficiency is to add a radiation barrier um, to just beneath your roof deck. And I happen to know about this because we just put one in our house. Okay. <laughs> um, and so did, did you guys do that? This is totally separate from the insulation. It's just under the rafters in your attic no not that we know of and i don't yeah. i don't know that it was mentioned so it's not mm -hmm. yeah yeah do you like um, yours well it's brand new um just did a diy install a few weeks ago and in, in, in anticipation for summer um and we've always had a challenge with upstairs bedrooms and being much hotter and so far though we will Will be it'll be put to the test here as we get into the hottest weather. Yeah. Um, I do feel like it's making a difference. They say it can reduce your attic temperatures by 10% or more, nice. um, which makes a big difference. So how was that home install, uh, Angelo? Is that doable for people to DIY? Easy for or? me. Um, you could probably have to talk to Brian who had to go in there with the full on, right. you know, mask and eye protection and all that. Um, it's, it's, it was pretty quick. It's just really a matter, a matter of stapling to your rafters, this stuff that looks kind of like bubble wrap, like mylar bubble wrap is sort of what it looked like. And then there's a couple of different types um, and you staple it onto your rafters. So it's just under your roof and it literally keeps the heat um, from transferring into the air space and the rafters themselves and the rest of the material inside your attic. All right, so we can just have people call Brian Oakley if you yeah. have this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> okay, um, okay uh, we'll jump over to um, another couple of questions from Jean about the audit and the insulation work. I don't know because you guys didn't live here. Um, at the time, but several years back, we had a whole Claremont um, home energy retrofit project, otherwise known as CHIRP. And um, a lot of homes were audited and upgraded for home energy efficiencies and uh, you know, made improvements like you guys did. Um, do you have any sense for, did you know about that maybe from Christine, your parents living here by chance, or do you have any comparison to, um, it sounds like the building doctor's process is very, very thorough. Yeah, no, I, it doesn't sound like we were, we were living here just yet uh, that we know that we know CHIRP and CHIRP's work pretty well. I, I think we, we missed that. So it would be hard to compare. Yeah. Um, that um, a, a lot of homes in Claremont um, did undergo some some significant upgrades as a result of that effort, and um, this is all additive. Maybe is what I'll add to that. That there's always more to do, <laughs> and anything you do is better than nothing, right? Well, pretty much, except if you have a bad install unfortunately like your attic for example so that's not to be taken to the extreme but um these things can be done in 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 steps okay i think i got uh most of those someone mentioned at least mentioned we used home performance matters for the home audit back then i'm assuming during chirp they do no longer do that. They've kind of changed that company is now changed and split into a window company and a solar company. So they're, um, they're still around, but they don't do exactly the same work that they used to. Um, was there, uh, there's a question about flammability of your insulation. Was that something that you guys discussed or were concerned about in your walls imagine um fiberglass is 
I don't know how flammable it is. <laughs> um, I know that the rock wool, I think, is the least flammable of the insulation types, maybe. For someone who asked, asked that question, I don't think it was a concern of yours or discussed in your... Not, it was not something that came up in that discussion. Becky's looking at the notes to see if there's anything yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. Dense packed fiberglass. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Dense packing helps if there's ever a fire because fire needs air as its fuel. If there's no air in the wall cavities, the chances of fire movement are drastically reduced. Excellent. Oh, and to Carolyn's question, dense packing helps your walls, dense packing your walls helps with noise reduction because sound waves can no longer bounce around as much inside the walls. There you go. Great. Perfect. All right, Angela, should I take it back to some other things, some other topics, or is there another question or two? Um, I'm gonna scroll through them again. I think that was the majority of them that I wanted to get at while we were talking about the audit and the insulation in particular. All right, I'll, I'll keep things going and then just let me know if we're ready for a few more. Um, so Christine and Becky, when you, you mentioned um, uh, Solaris um, Solar and how you went with sort of a, a, a middle of the road solar, rooftop solar array. Yeah. How'd you shop around for that? Like what, what was that process? And can you just tell us how that went? <laughs> we went through a pretty thorough process. How many, we, we did we it three. three different quotes. We had them come out and talk to the different, uh, the different folks. We got a quote I know some of that was were connections through Sustainable Claremont. So we came to an event a few years back uh, at the Sabaker's home that was uh -huh. talking about solar. Like my solar, perhaps. Yes, that's right. We did it. Yeah, yeah, we, we went, went through solar. them. Yep, yep, and yep. That's, I think that's how we narrowed down or, or connected with a few different options. Uh, that was the cheapest. That was the cheapest option. Which one? Semper Solar? No, actually, no. no. It was the guy who came that we like, we're not sure if he knew it all what he was talking about. <laughs> the third guy. Yeah. It was helpful yeah. to have in-person conversations with each of the, each of the three. Yeah. Uh, What's that process like when they come out? Like, so you, you call, call up one of these solar <laughs> installers and then what they come out, do they do measurements and sort of a full assessment and then give you some sense of cost and energy savings or what's, what's that look like? Yeah, I think a, a fair amount of the conversation was about cost and yeah, obviously they're assessing our roof and what kind of sun we get and where the panels would be best placed. Mm -hmm. uh, some estimates around how many panels we would need based on our based on our usage. So they were looking at past bills and in different times of year uh, and also thinking about future use. Uh, so Becky mentioned we want to move to electric cars as soon as our current cars give out. So they talked about making sure that we'd have capacity on our roof, either with our existing panels or that we would have space to add a panel uh, if need be, if we were to, if we were to uh, add the, the electric cars as well. Um, yeah, they had done, and Semper Solaris was just the most professional sales job, honestly. Like they just, they, they had diagrams and they had graphs and charts and we were just like, ooh, they know what they're talking about. And theirs were prettier then, which is silly because who cares? But they were like, they had, they were like, and ours are really, they had like very attractive. <laughs> we're like, ooh, but it's really kind of all the same, I think. Um, but they literally like went through, you know, cost of doing nothing, you know, uh, the cost of doing solar. Apparently we're gonna save $115,000 over 25 years. But the, I think most of those estimates are because of the price of electricity going up, which I think it does. So you're kind of, you're locking in your current rate effectively, whether you rent or buy. And I don't think, I think renting is actually a perfectly great option. I just think we just kind of tend to prefer to just be done with it, but. Right, depending on the timeline that, we, that you anticipate being in the home, Right. Uh, and we knew that we wanted to be here for life. So we made the investment. And I believe they're a veteran owned company, which is part of what. Yeah, you. they're veteran owned. Becky's a veteran as well. So that was uh, right. a point in favor, I believe. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, and the, the sales guy was funny. He was, <laughs> we had one sales guy show up though, who was like, he, he was like, he offered it at like a third of the price of the other ones who were like, no way, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, that's not even going to be solar. That's just going to be like a cardboard box on our roof. You know? like, Too good to be that true. Lowest bid that we just were like, uh, no, no, no. Give us something Too, too low. <laughs> yeah, it was right. like, we, because you don't know what you don't know. And so we were like, that can't be right, you know? Right. And so did you see the savings like pretty immediately? Like once solar's installed, now your electricity bill drops like by whatever. It, it was significant. We now pay $15 a month, which I think is just the base amount to be on the grid, yeah, right? to be yeah. pulling, to be pulling the electricity from the grid. It's 15 to 17 a month. Uh, it was not excessive before that. It was maybe a hundred a month, you know, yeah. probably it, had more in the summer peaks and valleys. Sure. Um, I can look, I can look back at all that, but it wasn't you know, for the cost of the solar to look at that differential over time d did not pay for itself or, or won't pay for itself for a long time. No, we're going to make $115,000. Um, I forgot about that. Let's spend it now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Let's go shopping. Right. Did you, so did, did they like math that out for you and tell yeah, you totally. look, like in like 10 years, you're going to have paid for this and yes. yeah, yeah. savings. I think what we appreciated about him as a salesperson though, is he was honest about that, that that's not a good enough incentive to do it. He said, you know, if that's, if this is about cost, it's not worth it. It's not going to pan out uh, in the ways that people hope it will. You'll see your monthly bills go down. Um, and certainly we, we see our usage go down. Uh, but I appreciated that about him, that he wasn't trying to make the sale based on the cost savings. Is that because your, your bills weren't that high to begin with, but if if you had completely electrified your home from the beginning, let's say just theoretically, yeah. maybe it would be different. Yeah, that's true. Cause we've, right. we've, we've been moving more stuff onto the, onto, onto the, mm -hmm. onto the, well, I mean, basically I can't wait to stick it to the man. Like I I'm waiting for batteries to get good enough that we can go off the grid. Like I'm really irritated by your sponsor, sorry, no offense, but like that, and, and this is like the emotional, uh, you know, every month after you get your, you know, you get, if you, if you're going to go solar, just be prepared because you're there, like by the time every month it says like, oh, we owe you $72, you know, like, because you're producing more electricity than you own. And like, by the time a whole year had gone up, when you settle up, they owed us 500 bucks. And I was like, all right, you know, we're going, going to Uno Trey Hotel for dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and they, and then I was like, Hey, where's my 500 bucks. And they're like, Oh, that's retail. We give you the wholesale price. I'm like, well, why didn't you put that in the bill? Like we got like $13 back, you know? And so they sell it back to you wholesale. Uh, and so anyways, don't be, don't be, don't get your false hopes up by seeing them. I, I think that's disingenuous and not very cool that they don't just have the wholesale price. And then, you know, when you go to call, cause, cause I was just truly was like, Oh, maybe there was a mistake or what happened. And it just, it just took forever to get someone who would answer a question. And they were like irritated by the question. And so, you know, as, as soon as batteries are good, we'll probably stop being team players in that regard <laughs> and, and uh, do our own thing. And, uh, um, but although if there were something kind of more local, uh, like a Claremont power share, you know, if there were like a Claremont grid, I feel like we do feel very invested in being team players locally uh, versus to, uh, you know, I, to a large business. Right. So, so that's is cool with local grid. Yeah, definitely. We had a, a brief conversation about, you know, microgrids at our first home tour. And it was kind of cool to, to hear about some of the ideas that are going around in Claremont. Um, we, are, are you thinking about, you know, now that you're, you're considering, you know, getting electric cars down the road, are, will increasing the size of your rooftop solar, is that sort of on the, the to-do list also once you start electrifying more or are you pretty happy with the system that you have or? We, we got enough to accommodate um, two electric cars. So we, we just have more than we need. That's probably why we were looking at a $500 surplus. Uh, but uh, 
and, and we would charge the cars at night when it's super right. cheap. And so um, I think we'll be, and plus we just don't even go anywhere. But I think probably the thing that would need us to throw up another um, panel would be in about 10 years when we um, shift out our HVAC and go off gas for, for that. That would probably be another panel is my guess. Mm -hmm. um, but who knows what other efficiency things we'll have in the next 10 years that might offset that or, you know, or, or where panels will be in 10 years. Right, right. That maybe, maybe we just need, you know, a microchip as big as your pinky. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? right? Yeah. Right. So when you um when once the solar was installed, is there like a dashboard that you have like on your phone or like oh yeah, a, yeah. Or like so you can see how much is being drawn in or what's oh yeah, I'm supposed to check that. Yeah. <laughs> is that something you you check all the time in the beginning and then you just never look at it again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm probably yeah. gonna look at it like eight panels aren't operational or something. But... <laughs> <laughs> on live tv <laughs> totally to look at yeah yeah totally did that like affect how you like consume the electricity during the day or or not really it's just kind of more interesting to just see how it was working and how much was coming in or... yeah we we've changed some of our habits just through this process and being more mindful of the better times to be you know running the dishwasher washing clothes um you know, using, not using the air, the air conditioning during peak times. Uh, so we've, I think the whole process just made us more mindful of, of our day-to-day -day practices. Uh, similarly with the water as well, because now, as, as Becky mentioned at the beginning, we don't have as much capacity for hot water. So we're, we're very mindful of the length of our showers. It's mm -hmm. probably a good uh, forcing mechanism for shorter showers because mm -hmm. the water turns really cold it's <laughs> so you want right. to wrap it up pretty quickly yeah. pretty good motivator <laughs> exactly probably a good thing yeah oh yeah i'm like freaking out right now thanks a lot Stu. um <laughs> no apparently we haven't really uh <laughs> electricity since may 5th or something no. but i think like the wi-fi goes out and you gotta like Ooh. update it or i don't know we'll go with that I, i'm assuming we still have solar being produced but it is worth checking we have done um planted the equivalent of 290 293 trees the app that we have shows you how many trees you've planted so excellent so nice. we'll take that is that the standard that they they tell you to install or that you you put in when they when you know solaris the app is the app just that an works app. with them yeah mm -hmm. it's it's an app called my solar edge okay and it, it hooks up to our uh, inverter, I think. Got it. Something like that. It, it, it's, it's plugged in outside. Right. And, right. and then goes over Wi Fi to this right. when it's working. Yeah, or not. Right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. No, actually, I'm really grateful because I remember Steve Sabaker saying if you don't check it, like it could just be not working. You have no idea. Then you just right. get this great big old electric bill, you know? Right. right. Good right. point. Okay, I'm going to ask one or two more questions here. And then Angela, can I throw it back to you for any mm -hmm. audience questions? Yep. Okay, you, you mentioned water. So this is my segue to landscaping. Um, with, yeah. with the pictures of the, the video that, that was put together, like one of the most, you know, just visually apparent changes um, from beginning to end was the landscaping. And when we were there, like I, I was sort of floored by how like lush it felt, you know, and how they're all California natives in the front yard from Cal BG and how cool that was. How'd you do that? Did you have like a, a landscape de designer or architect help you with that? Did you do it on your own? What was the, the landscaping process for the front and the backyard? I think uh, Becky mentioned earlier, we have a friend who's an architect and an interior designer. <sighs> she helped us think through quite a bit of that. Uh, just from a design <sighs> perspective, you know, helping us think through what do you use your backyard for? What do you use your front yard for? Uh, what utility do you want, you know, in terms of garden beds and things like that? Uh, and then the landscaper that Becky mentioned as well had a lot of great suggestions in terms of what types of plants would do well in the, in the different 
shade versus sun and morning sun, afternoon sun. Uh, so I think those were two big influences. And then the Botanic yeah. Gardens as well. They yeah. have been, they've given us a lot of great advice as we've purchased oh, yeah. different plants. They've been really helpful. I send them like videos of me talking it over. I'm like, hey, here's what's going on with my grass. You know, <laughs> they're like, they're so wonderful. They're like, oh, bring, bring. I brought in because there's a bunch of weeds in our front yard, and I was like, what is this? And I brought in and and I and I brought it in and put it in a baggie and I and, and left it with the 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 kiosk person, and then and then Peter emailed me and he was like, oh, that's such and such. Here's what you need to do. You know, they're awesome. Okay. Peter's amazing. Yeah. So but I, I, I was going to say our friend, Carrie, who's the architect though, uh, she drew, she drew mock-ups for us. She used Photoshop and, and, you know, just did like, and then, and then Ramiro just ran with it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we made, it was a design build too. So we, we, we did stuff as we went mm -hmm. and we're still course correcting yeah. um, with, we're seeing what's doing well and then planting more of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the sunflowers, me and Huck just, he's our seven-year-old, like two years ago, we planted um, like maybe five or six sunflowers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've, if you come by, you should see it. I mean, people stop and take pictures all the time. And uh, they just, they're having babies. Like I think that when they, when the, the, the sunflower seeds are in the flower and when they fall, they make new ones and it's just this, this like almost like arch of sunflowers and it's even going into the sidewalk now uh, and into the rocks and there, they just want to be there. And um, it's awesome. Like there's gotta be 50 of them and we planted like five. Mm -hmm. So we're just letting it do what it wants to do mostly. Our kids call it their botanic garden. They're like, Hey, let's go to the botanic garden. <laughs> and uh, they, they can name all the plants oh. and, but you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. Was there anything in that process where you like totally wish you, you know, hadn't done the way you did or like anything that was a total miss or what with the landscaping or not really? I'm trying to think. We wish not. we had done the DG path all the way. We, we she, Christine does the budget for our family and she has a budget line for regrets and do overs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we we have this little dg path along the eastern edge of our home that's like the botanic garden with the you know these big beautiful plants all alongside and we just sort of stopped it i don't know why you know in the front yard um and we had run subterranean um uh water water sprinklers you know because those are more water wise right in the front and we used native grasses all in the front. We got them all like plugs from the botanic garden. And uh, after about a month, we were like, this is just kind of weird that the path just stops. <laughs> and we wanted the path to go all the way. And you think it's no big whoop, but they actually had to dig up everything where the continuation of the path would be. They had to dig up the subterranean and cut it shorter, you know, and, and so it actually ended up being a lot more expensive to not get the path right the first time. Mm -hmm. I think everything else we've, we've, we've been blown away by how well the lipstick sages are doing. Those are those red sages and how well the Mexican sage mm -hmm. are doing. And so, um, we just, uh, we just bought about 40 more to make wow. the whole perimeter lipstick and, uh, Mexican sages. And, and, and uh, we have uh, two bunnies that are living in them right now. And, and, and it's just, we, we have five finch, finches, finch babies that were born and another nest being built. And we've got three baby squirrels were born. So it, like we have like a billion hummingbirds in our yard. And so, and, and yellow breasted finches and red finches and our kids get to, to enjoy and see all of the, the, the natural world is, comes right to us. And that's, I think it's because of how much native, uh, how many native plants and grasses we've planted. And so the native grass is kind of ugly. Um, and Drew was just asking. I yeah. thought it looked like yeah. real yeah, grass. Yeah. I thought it looked great. It's the Carex pragilicus, I think I want to say. There's two types that were native, Carex something, and there's two, but it was the longer, longer name. Um, it's just it always plus weeds. I think right it's now a lot of weeds. Yeah. Because we're by the park, 
we, you know, that the front yard is not really insulated from whatever weeds are in the park. And so just, you know, that's just going to be the name of the game, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I, 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 I've thought maybe we should have done zoysia in the front too, but I'm glad we have the native grass in the front. I, I have a feeling mm -hmm. that's kind of helping things out in, in the, in the overall ec ecology, even if it's not as attractive. For what it's worth, I thought it looked really good. I didn't realize it was like a native, like dart resistant grass. Yeah. Yeah, it looked great. Um, and what's the, what's the irrigation situation there? You have subsurface irrigation? And then subsurface in front and uh, rotor sprinklers in the back. Because uh, in the back we have a zoysia grass. Um, and then they plant rye in the winter. But in the summer it's this nice thick zoysia. It's doing fine as long as we water it. <laughs> There's one patch where <laughs> the sprinkler wasn't going to, um, and the subsurface is, is it's all doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, we we bump it up, you know, because when it's getting hot, mm -hmm. uh, and and we bump up our fruit trees to two times a week for 45 minutes each. In the winter, we do one time a week for less. Mm -hmm. So. Right uh, you know, our water bill, we're, we'll, we'll get slammed with the water bill for December. Yeah, Drew, Drew, that's it. That's what it's called. Drew's our wizard on the... It's not Pergillicus. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so close. It's close. We looked for buffalo grass, Carolyn, um, and we couldn't find any anywhere nearby, but we researched it and it looked really cool. It would have been my preference, actually, and we, even though it's not, you know, because I think it's made up, but it's awesome. And we, we just couldn't find any nearby. What's the maintenance on that? Is it same as regular grass? You need to mow it, you know? You don't have Saturday to. Or... Yeah, you don't have to. You can just let it go and it's supposed to be fine. But we but we have a lawn crew that comes every Friday and, and they mow it. They mow it almost every Friday. Okay. I think when, the, when it's going to seed, they'll let it go a little bit longer. Okay. And same <laughs> for watering, just like a normal grass? Or do you move the drip look. line? Is it less probably i think it's a little less because it's underwater underground um but it's not i don't think it's more than like 15 minutes or so okay yeah cool um angela i i just looked at the clock and i didn't realize how close to the, the end we are so are there some <laughs> questions that we ought to get to from the comment uh, box? yeah there were a few um there was a question way back sorry to jump back to the house stuff away from the landscaping. Um, someone asked if about gas fired point of use water heaters um, and wondered if building doctors um, mentioned that when you were considering replacing your water tank um, or if you know how if that came into your considerations at all what's it called a gas fired like a as a, a point a, of use so instead of a tank and heating a whole tank it's right like in your wall by your shower oh, and it neat. heats on demand it's more common in europe oh that's cool no i don't i've not heard of a gas powered one i i don't know like you can use electric one is there's an electric version of it mm -hmm. um we just knew we wanted to go electric, but um, it would be a good question for them. I mean, we found them to be very responsive, but um, sometimes I do wonder if uh, I actually, the, what, the, the, it, it's sort of like, they're like, well, you didn't ask that. You know what I mean? Like, like it looks, it's like, like, like the, 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 like the troll under the bridge in Monty Python. Like you have to ask exactly the right question, you know, like, like they, like when we came time to do our air conditioner, they only presented us gas ones and I called them back and I was like hey do y'all have this other kind and they're like yeah and I was like why didn't you mention that and they're like oh nobody wants them you know and so uh they're just you have to that's the weird thing is how much we and and, and we're learning stuff from you all on this call like how much of an effort it is for us to educate uh, so that we can even ask the right questions mm -hmm. and I'm right. sure there's like way better whiz bang things that we don't even know about you know so even though they're uh really helpful in terms of just giving you raw data about your house is still a fair amount of education and prioritizing and calculations that need to, to go on, it sounds like. So they're not going to give you 
a turnkey, here's what you need to do. And here's, you know, <laughs> necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 I mean, they did give us, you know, recommendations, but it was, it was just specifically within the energy audit, but I imagine there's a wider range of stuff they could talk about. Um, I think the tankless, I don't know that they have tankless ones that are electric. And so we probably, what we were offered was limited to our preference on electric. Cause we looked into solar water heaters too. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember why we didn't go that route, but we, we, we tried to look into as many different options as we could. Yeah. I, um, I think that there are some um, electric um, tankless systems, but they're really expensive and inefficient. It just takes a tremendous amount of power to heat water compared to gas. Um, so, sorry, I didn't I, I understand the question was about- Our water is um, very hot. It does work. <laughs> it's, it's very hot, good water. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh, I think the last question was really more kind of, again, around trying to understand more specifically what um, building doctors do and don't do. So you mentioned that they can do some of the work that they suggest. Do, is there anything they don't do? For example, do they do the electric electrical work do they have yeah. electricians and they have insulation people and oh yeah Electrician, the whole gamut plumbers, gas electric whatever you name it yeah yeah okay. but you're that. presented with quotes and you're not obligated you could just do the audit and then oh, yeah. you know, find your own contractors if you wanted and we did that with some but we were they, you know with some with some of the things we're like, oh, we've got a guy, you know, we, we've got a guy, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. Marcos could do that. And they were like, oh, totally, you know, don't, you know, and so. Yeah. Right. All right, great. It's so it's bedtime. So. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> All right, I've got like one more quick question. And then I, I think we've touched on all the major points. And um, one of the things I noticed or that you talked about, um, uh, Becky, was how you, you had been composting locally in your backyard and then you joined the, the community composting program through Sustainable Claremont through us. What's the, you know, why'd you stop doing it in your backyard? Like, was it just easier to, to have somebody else kind of handle all the, the food waste or is, do you do a little bit of both now or, or what? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, Dick is, hey, it's good to see you, Dick, by the way. Um, and we were, we bid at the Sustainable Claremont Gala. There's only two things we knew we wanted. We wanted all, that bourbon thing, uh, which some of those have, have received rave reviews from our guests. Um, and, um, and we wanted to learn how to do the compost, right? Because we had one of those great big compost barrels and just you know, it looked horrible. So zoo, this was like the peak pandemic. And so I, we did a zoom call with Dick and I like, was like holding my computer over the compost. And he was like, Oh girl, <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, uh, I was like, yeah, it's horrible. And, um, and, and, and like I was, he, he, Dick was willing to educate us on what we needed to do, but he was like, you know, we've got this compost thing. And I was like, well, that's so much better. And we're, we're we attend the local Quaker meeting anyways. And so it's just, um, it, we go to now, you know, once, once that opens back up that the Quaker meeting will meet again in person in July, we'll just bring our compost <laughs> to the meeting and just take care of it. And, and I have to say that the, the, the first of all, I think it's been great for us. It's way reduced our our garbage. Like God, man, what were we doing? Because uh, we just we eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, and so there's just a lot of fruit and vegetable parts you don't eat. Um, and uh, but the soil, the 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 so we just do a round trip. We dump off the yuck, and then we go scoop and pick up a whole big Home Depot basket full of just gorgeous compost. And I go throw it in our garden and our garden has never been better. Mm -hmm. Our garden is insane how much it produces and we can't even keep up with it. Like every day it's making a cucumber now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
and it, I, I'm, I'm convinced it's because that compost is so fabulous. And, and it's, we, we, we tell everybody we know about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're like, you gotta do the compost thing. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. And right, it, feels, yeah. it feels good to be part of something bigger than ourselves, you know, in a, in a, in a local way. I feel like when you start composting, you realize how much food waste you have. Even if you're good about not wasting food, there's just like so many scraps that would otherwise go in the garbage. So it's a... We fill up a, a bucket a week. Right, right. You know, and uh, it's, it's, you know, and we, we try to be conscientious about not wasting food for sure. Right. right. Yeah. It's right. just so satisfying though, as you said, to turn around and make more food with it. <laughs> Right. Oh, close yeah. The loop. yeah. Yeah. Close the loop. It's really satisfying. I think the movie, there have been two movies that have really stuck with us. One, one was uh, Biggest Little Farm. Um, and I was like, for like six months afterwards, I was like, we should just move and get a farm. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a lot of work. Um, and then uh, it's it, what Kiss, Kiss the Ground. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I say dirt, but it's kiss the ground, right? Uh, right. With Woody Harrelson talking about the whole um, dirt, the, the soil, the health of the soil. Oh my God. It's just generative agriculture. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. That is like where it's at. And mm -hmm. the, the clock is ticking. If there's 59 harvests left in the, in the great American plains, you know, and so that's not a long time. I mean, yeah. first we're going to lose our roof. And then we're going <laughs> like, to, then it's going to be Mad Max. <laughs> right. There's something like, especially like gratifying too, about like it all being local. So like yeah. you can shop local or produce local and then turn that waste into like locally grown soil that you could, you know, reuse just, you know, it all it's feel good stuff too, on top of it just being quality stuff. Well, and you know, this is like another, another topic for another day, but we should not be paying for somebody to take that somewhere else you know drive I mean, I, it somewhere else yeah, yeah exactly like I think it's just a matter of getting to the right level of scale but uh I think it's a, a, a lack of imagination and and vision and and willpower that we're we're not expanding that immediately right now everywhere in Claremont so anything we can do to help support that count count us in yeah soon we'll get it there We'll scale it up. All right, Angela, anything else we missed or anything else we need? Any I, I really, if, yeah, I really don't think so. If for some reason I missed somebody, I really apologize. I've been up and down this chat and I think we've managed to touch on or you answered in one way or another, all the other questions. And thank you to everyone who chimed in on the chat and asked your questions. We really want this to be driven by the audience. So thank you very much. Definitely. And Becky and Christine, anything else that you'd like to add? Or are we good to go? Uh, we're just so grateful for Sustainable Claremont. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being such a local force and educator. You were, I think you were the first organization that we connected with after we moved back here. And you've just done such great work and taught us so much already. So thank you yeah. for your leadership. Oh, awesome. Awesome. It's a, it's the community, right? It's all of us right. pitching in together. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much, Becky and Christine. Thank you, you know, in particular for, you know, it was a lot of time and a lot of work went into this and sharing yeah. your experience yeah. and like your, your know-how and, and all that time you, you put into is super helpful. And I, I think it really helped people out tonight. So again, thank you everybody so much for being part of this. We've got one more next week. We're really focusing on renters and on senior communities next week. So a little different feel than, than tonight in the past two, but a really important one um, as well. Um, so that's it. You all have a great night and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay.